the goal for today's class is to eventually talk about mirror descent method. But before I start talking about mirror descent, I want to um, uh, unify the understanding of all the different algorithms we have studied for unconstrained optimization as well as constrained optimization. So the unconstrained optimization, if you remember, we were, we basically noted that our algorithm should be um, something like xk plus one equals to xk minus alpha k dk gradient of fxk. Alpha k is the step size, dk is positive definite matrix, and the gradient of f, f is evaluated at xk. Okay, so now let me write the following um, equation. equals to argmin x in capital X. So capital X is the set over which we are trying to minimize the function. Gradient of fxk transpose x minus xk plus one over two alpha k x minus xk transpose hk x minus xk. Okay, so this particular expression unifies all the algorithms um, that we have studied so far. So let's see how. Let me look at unconstrained case where x is equals to Rn, hk equals to identity corresponds to steepest descent. general gradient descent hk equals to dk inverse newton's method hk equals to second derivative of the function evaluated at xk okay so these were the three main methods we had talked about. Well, we also talked about Gauss-Newton where HK was. Well, let me just write about Gauss-Newton as well. Where I'll refer you to the lecture on the Gauss-Newton for the notation of gradient G. Okay, does this make sense? Are you convinced that for the specific choice of HK, we can actually recover all the unconstrained optimization algorithms we talked about? Okay. All right, let's uh, 
look at the constraint case where x is a convex closed convex set x is a closed convex set in euclidean space uh, we talked about conditional gradient method In this case, HK was zero. But I want to make a note that the update scheme there was XK plus one equals to XK plus alpha K X bar K minus XK. And this X bar K was the argument. Okay, that was conditional gradient method. Then we talked about gradient projection method. Where HK was identity matrix. And here, if the point XK goes out of the set, then you had to do a projection. So that particular problem was equivalent to taking HK equals to identity in this particular expression. All right. In manifold suboptimization, We basically, instead of doing the argument over the entire space, capital X, we basically did argument over XK. Which is a subset of capital X. So instead of looking um, for solution or, or, or the descent direction over the entire space, uh, entire convex set, we just constrained ourselves to a specific you know, vert, uh, edge of the convex set and we're looking for optimal sol solution along that particular edge. That was the manifold suboptimization method we, con we talked about in the previous class. So any questions so far? This is all the algorithms we have talked about. Well, we have talked about a couple of extra algorithms, which is the conjugate gradient method and BFGS method. But in BFGS method, we were talking more about how to update HK or DK based on the new data that is arriving. But it was also within the part of uh, gradient descent method. Any, any questions so far? Any comments? Are you able to hear me? Yes. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Okay. So now let me ask you a question. Uh, well, let me give you two more. Um, let Let me give you two more examples in the constraint situation. So. So new algorithms, so one more new algorithm is scaled gradient projection. Where you pick HK as some positive definite matrix. Okay, so this is uh, similar to this gradient descent method. Oh, uh, and then of course constrained 
Newton's method where HK as you might guess is second derivative of the function f at xk. Okay. And this is the constrained version of the Newton's method. Okay, and now you can do a lot of mix and match. You can mix uh, manifold suboptimization with constrained Newton. You can do, you know, any other mix and match policy. Pick some value of HK, pick some way of alpha, picking alpha K, uh, pick some subset of capital X and you get sort of a new algorithm for solving the constrained optimization or unconstrained optimization problems. Okay, any question on this two new algorithms? I think they are pretty straightforward. You, they are just the constrained version of the unconstrained algorithms we have already talked about in quite a detail earlier. Okay, no further question. Let's move to mirror descent. So this is the first time I'm teaching this topic, mirror descent in the class. And I haven't necessarily implemented any of the mirror descent algorithms myself. So I just uh, don't know a lot about mirror descent, but uh, I do want to cover this topic because it has become quite a, um, a very well studied topic in the past five or six years. So that's why I think it's an important topic um, with applications in signal processing and machine learning. Uh, and since a large number of people in the class are interested in these two topics, I thought I'll go over mirror descent method um, and talk about what this algorithm is. So remember in the previous um, page, I had written about to alpha k. Okay, this was our mirror, uh, sorry, this was a regular, uh, you know, different classes of algorithms for specific value of hk. The idea in mirror descent is to replace this term. This is a quadratic function. Uh, so I want to replace the quadratic function with some other uh, convex function. And the particular class of convex functions that we would be studying in this case is called Bregman divergence. Okay. So Let's, let's try and think about it. What exactly is this term x, x minus xk transpose hk x minus xk? What exactly is this term measuring? Okay, so one way to think about it is this term is somehow measuring the distance between x and xk. So if x minus xk is far, then this term is going to dominate the, this term, the other term. But if x minus xk is small, this term is going to be small and this term is going to dominate the optimization routine. Uh, more importantly, this is a linear function of x. So remember this is gradient of fxk, which is some vector transpose x. And this is a quadratic function of x. So this particular objective function is actually strongly convex, assuming the hk is positive definite. 
So if we replace this convex function with some other Bregman divergence, we would still retain the strong convexity part. Uh, and I'm going to talk about what Bregman divergence is. Uh, it will retain the convexity and therefore you will have a unique result, unique uh, minimum. But at the same time, you may be able to adapt to the geometry of the function very well. Um, if you, if, if the function had some desirable properties, which are typically satisfied in many machine learning and, um, uh, and uh, signal processing algorithms. So the benefits of this is better convergence guarantee when when n is large. n is the dimension of uh, the Euclidean space, the space over which you are trying to minimize the function. Um, and then uh, useful if x is a subset of Rn but with some Lp non. Okay, so so far we have always been talking about Euclidean space with the uh, two norm, but suppose in some application you are looking at X, which is a subset of Rn with LP norm, then suddenly using the quadratic term here doesn't really make much sense. And therefore you should talk about some other, using some other convex function. And it's also useful when the function F is relatively smooth. And this is also a term that I need to define shortly. So there are two things I need to define. One is Bregman divergence and the other thing is relatively smooth functions. Any, any questions so far? So why do we use Bregman divergence or not other uh, divergence metrics? So you can use other divergence, but I think, uh, uh, so Bregman divergence is sufficiently large class of divergence functions. And mm -hmm. uh, I think people have, uh, have had very good, uh, um, you know, empirical results with specific Bregman, not just empirical, also theoretical results with some specific Bregman divergences, which I will talk about. So I think that's why, you know, people replace uh, this quadratic term with some sort of Bregman divergence. Okay. Thanks. Okay. All right. So this is uh, the whole idea of mirror descent. So let's talk about Bregman divergence and then we'll talk about relatively smooth functions. Bregman divergence. So I don't think I have talked about uh, strongly convex functions. Have I, have I introduced strongly convex functions before? Is everyone clear on what strongly convex function is? No? Yes? Uh, no. No, okay. So let's say omega from R into R um, is strongly convex if and only if omega x is greater than omega y plus gradient omega y transpose x minus y plus one over two sigma over two norm of x minus y square. So let me put sigma strongly convex. 
Okay, so if omega is uh, twice differentiable, this is equivalent to saying that the second derivative of omega is greater than equal to sigma identity. So this is a positive definite matrix. And what I'm saying is all the eigenvalues of the positive definite matrix is greater than or equal to sigma. And I'm of course using Rn here, but it could be defined on some specific domain. Um, what should I use the domain? Let me use E as the domain. So you could have the strongly convex function over a specific domain, like a simplex or a unit sphere or whatever doesn't necessarily have to be Rn. Okay, so this is a definition of a strongly convex function, in but actually sigma strongly convex function. So there is this sigma over two term here that uh, needs to be there for strongly convex function. For convex function, you know, this sigma could be zero, okay? But for strongly convex function, the sigma has to be strictly positive. I haven't written here, but sigma has to be strictly positive. Okay, so we define Bregman divergence B of omega x comma y equals to omega x minus omega y minus All right, so what properties of Bregman divergence is obvious? I think you can look at this expression. So I'm picking an, a strongly sigma strongly convex omega and I'm defining my Bregman divergence B of omega as a function of X comma Y in this particular fashion. So what are the properties that's obvious to you? Non-negative. Non negative, okay, that's great. Okay, it's non negative, um, but it's it's actually more than non negative. So, so do you have a further refinement of this inequality? It's the most strongly convex. Sorry, can you say that again? Uh, is it the most strongly convex? Uh, your voice is very loud. Uh, uh, is it sigma strongly convex? Yes, yes, it is sigma strongly convex. So omega is sigma strongly convex. That's right. So any any further refinement of this inequality? So I know that B omega is non-negative, but can we say something more about B omega? Actually, uh, let me think, is it? Well, it's strongly convex in X, but not in Y or may not be in Y. 
okay uh, okay so that's first the second is for a fixed y b omega dot comma y is sigma strongly convex okay uh, what else so what happens if x what happens if x is equal to y my divergence is actually zero so it works both ways if your divergence is zero it means x is equal to y and if x is equal to y it means that the divergence is equal to zero okay so if if you are at the same point it just acts like a distance function uh, so if you are at a um, if if x is equal to y then the then you know that the distance between the two points is zero and it turns out that the divergence between the two points is also zero and in general the divergence is is non-negative okay so b of omega xy is non-negative and if x is equal to y then b omega of xy is equal to zero so the two things it doesn't satisfy is uh, you know so typically a metric or a distance function would satisfy two other conditions one is symmetry and the other is triangle inequality and b omega in general is not symmetric and does not satisfy triangle inequality so b omega may not be symmetric and does not satisfy triangle inequality Okay, so these are the two important uh, things you should know about B omega. That's why it's a divergence and not a distance. Okay, a, a distance necessarily has to be non-negative and should satisfy this property and must be symmetric and must satisfy triangle inequality. But because it doesn't satisfy symmetry, so B omega doesn't satisfy symmetry and triangle inequality, it is called a divergence. All right, um, so that introduces Bregman divergence. Let me give you a few examples of Bregman divergence. So if I pick omega equals to the usual two norm of x squared, omega of x, then b omega of xy would be half x transpose x minus half y transpose y minus y transpose x minus y. Can someone tell me what is this equal to? Maybe someone can do the same to zero. Uh, or no, it can't be zero. No, it won't. Like one over two y transpose y uh, minus. Uh, there is a more simplified expression. Oh, one, one over two x x minus a x minus y x minus y squared, uh, squared. yeah, a square, right. yeah. Right, so it's basically the usual Euclidean distance. Usual Euclidean distance. Okay, so if you, if you pick your omega x to be the, uh, the, the usual quadratic function, 
then your B omega, the Bregman divergence is the usual Euclidean distance between the two points. Well, it's the distance square, but, uh, but it's, it's equivalent. The second uh, very important, so in this case, your X is in Rn. Uh, the second very important Bregman divergence is Xi log of Xi summation i equals one to capital N. And this is for all X greater than equal to zero. And we will define T log T to be equal to zero. Sorry, T log T is equal to zero when T is equal to zero. Well, let me just write zero log zero is equal to zero. So if you take the limit of t log t as t goes to zero, you will find that it is equal to zero and therefore um, having this equality makes perfect sense. Okay, so this only works in the positive orthend of the uh, Euclidean space. So let's look at the Bregman divergence. Now let's, so first we have to ascertain that this is strongly convex. So let's look at the second derivative of omega. What's the second derivative of omega? Let's, let's think about the first derivative of omega first. So what's the first derivative of omega? So that is xi over xi plus log xi. This whole thing in the matrix form. So that is one plus log x1, one plus log xn. That's the first derivative. What's the second derivative? The variable matrix one over xn. Yes. One over xn. It's a diagonal matrix one over xi. Great. So is this a strongly convex function? Well, if I may, if I may change my question, under what conditions is this a strongly convex function? So remember, this has to be greater than or equal to sigma i for it to be strongly convex function, which means each of these diagonal entries have to be greater than sigma. So under what conditions is this a strongly convex function? If sigma is smaller than one over the, is the minimum. Of one right. Over the. Right. So you want, so omega, is strongly, is sigma strongly convex over the set E defined as X greater than equal to zero, XI less than equal to one over sigma. Okay, so if I bound the set, then within that particular set, this is a strongly convex function. So such a set E would look like a box, okay, in the positive orthend. And uh, uh, of course, any subset within the box is also fine. So if I have a subset within this box, that's also fine as long as it's a convex subset.
Okay, so we have ascertained ourselves that uh, omega is a strongly convex function. And therefore, I can define V omega of x, y within this particular box set. And that can be defined as summation xi log xi minus summation yi log yi minus summation i equals one to n And this is, after some simplification, this is summation of xi log xi over yi. And I think there should be also a I think one term is missing. Oh, plus minus summation xi minus yi i equals one to n. Okay, so this is also a valid Bregman divergence. Typically, this divergence is used when uh, on the set, on the simplex, where x is greater than or equal to zero, summation of x i is equal to one. So this is the set of all probability distributions over n objects. And sorry in which case this term dies out. So basically summation of xi minus yi is equal to zero. And on this set, V of omega xy is summation of xi log xi over yi, i equals one to n. And this is known as scale divergence. Okay, so these are the two usual divergence. Uh, one is the Euclidean distance and the other is scale divergence. These two divergence are used a lot in, um, in optimization, particularly machine learning type optimization. So that's where mirror descent turns out to be very useful. Okay, so Going back to the discussion on mirror descent, um, you can replace this term by Bregman divergence. B omega x x k. Okay, so that's, so once you replace this uh, x minus x k transpose h k x minus x k with the Bregman divergence, um, you will get the mirror descent algorithm. That's the famous mirror descent algorithm. Any, any question on uh, mirror descent? OK, 
okay now i can define what function f is relatively smooth means it means that f of x f of y is less than equal to f of x plus gradient fx transpose y minus x plus some lipschitz constant l b omega uh, y y comma x this is the definition of relatively so f is relatively smooth with respect to omega Okay, so because of this relatively smooth quantity, uh, what you want to do is you want to minimize, of course, you want to find a feasible direction in which you want to descend, but you know, solving the original optimization problem is difficult. So what you do is you uh, look, at the, look at an upper envelope of the function around x or xk, and then you replace that upper envelope with uh, the function that you are trying to minimize within this argument. And that again leads to a mirror descent algorithm. Okay, any questions so far on mirror descent algorithm? So all in all, if you have a very large dimensional problem, if your X is, if your RN is extremely large, uh, you probably are better off using mirror descent algorithm rather than the usual gradient projection algorithm or, or some, other, some other first order algorithm. Okay, no questions. The next algorithm that I want to talk about is proximal gradient algorithm. In this case, the goal is to minimize fx plus hx, um, where x is in uh, some uh, closed convex set capital X. Here F gradient F is Lipschitz. H is convex, but may not be, but gradient of H may not be Lipschitz. Oh, one thing I know I, I would like to note here is that mi mirror descent algorithm is uh, guaranteed to converge under certain conditions on the step size, but it requires the function f to have Lipschitz gradient. So gradient of f should be Lipschitz for mirror descent algorithm to work, actually provably work. I'm sure for non-Lipschitz function, you can make it work under certain initial condition and so on, but, but it won't work globally you won't always get to the optimal solution. But if your function has uh, Lipschitz gradients, then under certain step size selection rules, you will converge to the optimal solution eventually. And the convergence guarantee is also pretty good. So your rate of convergence is very fast. All right, so one option is, uh, you can use 
I mean, you can try to use uh, something like a gradient projection method or mirror descent method here, but because your gradient of H may not be Lipschitz, but H is still convex, um, you may not be willing to use that algorithm uh, because you don't get guaranteed convergence or there may be some structure in the, the function H of X that you can exploit uh, but you don't want to take the derivative of the function h. So those are the situations where the proximal gradient algorithm makes sense. So this is, in this algorithm, there are sort of two steps. First, uh, you can write your xk plus one equals to argmin x in capital X. So I take only the first derivative with respect to the function f, I retain hx as it is. And then I add the usual quadratic term that we have been talking about so far. after some algebraic manipulation, one can show that this algorithm is equivalent to the following algorithm. Okay, so what is this algorithm? So I have sum of two functions in which the gra gradient of one function is Lipschitz continuous, whereas the gradient of other function may or may not exist, or if it exists, it may not be Lipschitz continuous. But we know that H of X is convex. And we want to minimize this function, this sum of two function over a convex set. So one idea is to use one of the existing methods that we have already studied to solve this problem, but uh, but it may not give you a good performance because your gradient of H is not Lipschitz or alternatively um, solving this minimization problem with just HX may be much easier than solving the minimization problem with gradient of F plus gradient of H transpose X minus XK. So therefore you want to exploit this inherent structure within your optimization problem to simplify the overall algorithm, okay? So that's why this method, proximal gradient method is useful. So here you define your xk plus one as the usual gradient fxk transpose x minus xk. This is the term that we have been talking about since the very beginning of this class. But instead of taking the gradient with respect to gradient of h with respect to xk, uh, we will just retain h of x here and not replace it with the first order um, uh, the first order approximation. And then we have the usual X minus XK square term. And after you do some algebraic manipulation, it turns out that you can split it into two expressions. One where you take the regular gradient descent step. So XK minus alpha K gradient of F at XK, the usual gradient descent step, you get ZK. And then this ZK actually gets fed into the update scheme for xk plus one, where you are just doing the minimization of h of x plus some um, quadratic term, okay? And the hope is 
that this particular optimization is simple. If this optimization is simple, then, um, then, then this algorithm, this overall algorithm is much, much simpler than running the, um, one of the earlier methods. That's the proximal gradient algorithm. Um, so mirror descent and proximal gradients have received quite a bit of attention in the past five or six years. And there is a whole body of literature now with various uh, variations of mirror descent algorithm and proximal gradient algorithm. So I just thought it will be cool for us to learn about these two algorithms. And if any of you are uh, working in this area or, or are interested in exploring this for in your project or in your research, you may find these methods useful because of uh, superior guarantees, convergence guarantees that have been obtained for different classes of problems. So that uh, brings me to the end of my class. We still have about four minutes left. So if you have any questions on whatever we have covered today, please feel free to ask. And after the class is over, you can ask me questions on um, something else, maybe homework or, or assignment or anything else. Any question? Uh, Professor? Uh, yes. Uh, I have one doubt. Yeah. Uh, it's in the proximal gradient algorithm only. Uh, okay. Uh, I think uh, I, what I understood is this uh, we are using uh, the update test. Uh, updated H, uh, is rule because the gradient of H, H is not Lipschitz. So I was wondering if uh, the whole function like fx plus hx was not Lipschitz. Right. So can we just neglect the gradient of fxk transpose x minus xk and just use the total sum to find uh, the minimum in some random case? Right. That's exactly what proximal gradient is doing. So we are not expanding H but we are expanding F, right? So we are taking the Taylor series uh, around F, but not around H of X, K. Um, um, it was like, uh, my doubt was if, uh, uh, if I consider a function F that is not Lipschitz, uh, uh -huh. that whose gradient is not Lipschitz. Uh -huh. So can I just use uh, uh, in the optimization, the minimization rule argument uh, in this space, just FX, uh, like you can, but, but that's the whole problem, right? So, I mean, you want to minimize, um, I see what your, your question is. So you want to minimize FX plus HX, right? Yes. X is in capital X and you want to somehow simplify this optimization routine, right? So you want to come up with a simpler method to solve this complicated problem. Now, if you define, let's say, according to your expression, okay, so this is what you are suggesting. I mean, this problem is as bad as the original problem you started with, right? So this is, this is a hard problem. If it was an easy problem, you don't need to find an algorithm to solve it. So this is a hard optimization and you're replacing it with, you know, a, an equally hard optimization because this quadratic term doesn't seem to be helping us simplifying the optimization. Uh, then uh, how come uh, we are able to like in the above one, it is making it simple. So this is, so this expression does not look simple, right? Yes, but uh, this expression is actually equivalent to running this algorithm. Okay. Right. So this is equivalent. See, I've written, this is equivalent to the above expression, but in this case, you have to have an additional term ZK, which, you know, which is just an intermediate variable. So it's not a problem. And the whole idea is that perhaps solving this argument of HX plus some quadratic term is much easier than trying to solve the original problem, which is this problem. Okay, so like, uh, so to solve that the original problem, we modified it uh, by right. the second problem. And then we found that 
there's another yes. way to write this and that yes. is simple yes so this was this is the idea for proximal gradient algorithm or i am wrong in this no this is exactly the idea of proximal gradient algorithm you are okay. you are bang on okay okay uh, no, thank you for i understood that i did not and, see and the... you know where this this expression is simple you can just look up the literature in signal processing literature or machine learning literature to figure out for what types of hx this algorithm is simple like this argument is simple i will give you some such problem in either midterm or an assignment later on uh, so that you see for yourself that solving such an algorithm is much easier okay thank you professor yeah sure any other question on the on today's lecture all right so that's it uh, if if you have questions on the assignment or something you can stay back or feel free to leave the class any question on the assignment okay seems like no further question so i'll see you guys on wednesday Uh, we'll talk about KKD theorem on Wednesday. A uh, professor. Yes. A a a a question about uh, today's class in in that uh, uh the second uh, example you gave us in that uh, omega fun omega x. Right. Oh, Wegman divergence. Yeah. Uh huh. So 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 here uh the the that fact you write this e uh e you e. write. Uh, Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. X. Uh, up, up a little bit. Oh, up. Up, up. Yes, yes. This you write fa fact. Uh, fact. Where did I write fact? Uh, oh, is this is this E you are talking about? This E. Uh, yes. Go down, go down a little bit. In in that second uh, ex example you show us. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Oh, yes, this yeah. E. Okay, sorry. Yeah, this E. That's right. Uh, so, so this x should be greater than zero, or it can be equal to zero. It can be equal to zero. So, remember we have assumed the convention that zero log zero is equal to zero. So, even if your x is equal to zero, your summation of x i log x i will be equal to zero. Uh, then the second gradient will also. Equals blow up, to... yeah. This gradient will blow up, but it will still remain greater than equal to sigma i. No, 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 no. I, 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 I'm thinking that when x equals zero, the second second, since you define x i log x i equals zero, then second gradient will be will blow up. Or... Right. Oh, okay, right. okay. Yeah. I see. I see. I see. Thank you. Yeah. So there are quite a few. examples where the second derivative blows up pretty quickly right so uh -huh. uh think about square root of x okay so even the first derivative blows up around 0 oh, yes yes i see square root of x right so you could have situation where the function itself doesn't blow up it's finite but the first derivative or the second derivative can blow up pretty quickly i see i see thank you yeah. and 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 you say that when you write the benefits of Merrill descent algorithm. You you say you you see you say function f is relative smooth. So so, so this is a benefit or this is, I mean so right. Does, so if does, you does know it, that the function f is relatively smooth with respect to some omega, then you can use the Bregman divergence in this in this region of the argument. So instead of x minus x k transpose h k, you can use this particular Bregman divergence b omega y comma x right here. Okay, I see. Thank you so much. Yeah. So so this is a, not a benefit. This is kind of a, we can use this when f is relative smooth. That's right. That's right. Okay. But the question is under what? Like you have to have a specific example or a specific application where the function f is naturally relatively smooth with respect to some convex, strongly convex function. 
Okay, thank you so much. And could you explain a little bit about the, the, the second uh, benefit here? So, so you said it's useful. If right, we'll... right. So this is a, uh, so this is something that's mentioned in a few papers and books that I've read on mirror descent without necessarily uh, talking about application. And, and the problem is that I read all theory papers, so they don't care about applications. So I don't care about applications either. However, the idea is, uh, okay, so you know what a Hilbert space is? Yes. Oh, okay. So you see R2, so R with the Euclidean norm is actually a Hilbert space because the inner product is defined on this space. So X, Y is X transpose Y, and then the norm is introduced from this inner product. Uh, but if you look at R comma LP, then it just uh, is a complete space, but it's not a, it doesn't have an inner product structure inbuilt yes. into it. So, the idea is to try and, but however, remember, however, this P norm is still a convex function. It's, it's a strongly convex function. So the idea is basically you want to, if your, if your X doesn't have the usual Euclidean distance and the inner product doesn't make any sense, you still want to be able to run the optimization without necessarily appealing to um, inner product. And that's where mirror descent algorithm also becomes useful. More generally, proximal gradient algorithm becomes useful. Okay, so somehow the Bregman divergence will, will simplify or accelerate the convergence to the optimal solution in these non uh, non euclidean or non hilbert spaces and if you want to learn well again a theory book to learn about these issues is to look at the book by amir beck first order methods in optimization i think this is available online through university website so you can just download the pdf and you can look into it I think that this is the name of the book and you can learn a little bit more about um, uh, why this particular uh, uh, situation is been, so what kind of benefits do you get under these situation uh, using mirror descent algorithm. Okay, thank you, Professor. It's a little bit hard to understand. The yes, it's, I, I know it's a, it's a bit hard to understand. So that's why I didn't cover it in details in the class. And I, I haven't seen any applications myself. So I'm sort of at a loss at this point of time to explain this better. Thank you so much. Sure. Any other question? Okay, see you guys on Wednesday then.